Hello, this is Supreme Court in the Federal Judiciary, Section B Lecture. Our prioritized standard is Government Civics Standard 22. Objectively, we're going to examine the scope of the judicial power of the national government. The Federal Judiciary is limited in the cases that they may hear. Cases that fall under the exclusive federal jurisdiction of the federal courts include cases where the subject matter involves or concerns rather the interpretation and application of provisions in the Constitution. Also, cases where the United States or one of its officers or agencies is actually a party. And also cases where one state sues another state uh, or one state sues a resident of another state or one state uh, sues a foreign government or one of its subjects. Also, cases where a citizen of one state sues a citizen of another state or a citizen of one state sues a foreign government for that matter or one of its subjects. Uh, also, a citizen of one state suing a citizen of the same state where both claim land under grants from different states, which is very, uh, yeah. And also cases involving diplomats, ambassadors, councils, or representatives of some type of foreign government. So if it doesn't meet any of those criteria, uh, you can't hear it in a federal court is what that means. The federal judiciary is made up of three main levels of courts. The lowest level includes trial courts, which initially decide cases. Above the trial courts are appellate courts, which review cases already decided in a trial court. And then the highest level is the Supreme Court, which has final authority over all cases. Now, each of the 50 U.S. states actually has its own system of courts, Courts which hear most of these cases, uh, most of the cases in the United States, especially cases that involve state crimes, yet the highest level is always still the U.S. Constitution. So if you look at this one for Tennessee, it kind of shows the different system. They have a Tennessee Supreme Court system, and then that can actually go on to the U.S. potentially also. While the federal judiciary is limited in the types of cases it can hear, the Supreme Court and the other federal courts have tremendous power in shaping federal laws through their court decisions. The federal courts have the ability to review questions arising under the Constitution, acts of Congress, executive orders, treaties of the United States, or any other action of the government in a power that's known as judicial review. Now, judicial review is the power to determine the constitutionality of a government action. So you can actually look at and determine, is this doing what the Constitution says it's supposed to be doing? Now, judicial review was actually created through the Marbury versus Madison of 1803 case, which said the court has a responsibility to ensure government actions are in fact constitutional. It did so in a four to zero margin. Now, judicial review, this actually serves as a check against the other branches. So if Congress does something that is uh, unconstitutional, or if the president does an action that might be unconstitutional, this is uh, something the courts can do to limit that. Now, federal courts also have the power of judicial interpretation, which is the power to decide what congressional laws or executive orders mean and how they actually apply in specific cases. Now, judicial interpretation is also a check um, against the other branches of the federal government. So it's not necessarily saying that what they're doing is illegal, but it actually can influence how exactly uh, those actions are taken long term. With the immense power that the court decisions can have, there is much debate as to what role the federal court should have regarding the policy-making powers of the court. Some feel that courts should exercise what's called judicial activism, which is the belief that the courts must correct injustices perpetuated or ignored by the other branches of the government. So as majorities impose their will, judicial activism therefore can guarantee the rights of minority groups. Uh, so that doesn't just mean ethnic minorities, any situation where you might be a minority. So like if you're the only Christian in a group of atheists, again, I would try to protect that. Now, supporters of judicial activism would consider the Constitution to be a living document that changes as the country changes. Uh, so the label of judicial activist, when you hear that, commonly that's going to be more associated with judges that are considered either liberal or more progressive. 
Now, others feel that courts should exercise judicial restraint, which is the belief that it is the duty of courts to ensure that the Constitution is enforced as it was written and originally intended to be applied. Now, with judicial restraint, courts should uphold acts of Congress and state legislatures unless they are in clear violation of the Constitution. Now, supporters of judicial restraint are concerned with the original intent of the Founding Fathers when deciding a case. Oftentimes, if you hear that label judicial restraint, that's usually going to be more associated, associated with judges that are considered conservative. Now, the claim of judicial activism is usually used negatively under the premise that the court has somehow overstepped its authority, or legislating from the bench, as people sometimes say, and somehow violated its constitutional separation of powers. Now, critics claim that federal courts should merely interpret the law rather than make law. But supporters say that this is just going to be another aspect of judicial review. Now, if it is the duty of federal courts to show judicial activism or judicial restraint is an open question that is likely to not be resolved anytime soon. The Supreme Court has special significance in the federal judiciary. Federal courts have either original jurisdiction, which is the power to hear a case before any other court, or appellate jurisdiction, which is authority to hear decisions of lower courts. But the Supreme Court actually has original jurisdiction and both appellate jurisdiction. So if we talk about like the district courts, uh, they have original jurisdiction. If you talk about the uh, appellate courts, they have appellate jurisdiction. The Supreme Court actually has both these powers. The court has original jurisdiction in cases affecting diplomats and those in which a state is a party. So those are the ones they're probably going to have first dibs on. Now, the court uses its appellate jurisdiction when at least four justices agree to hear a case from one of the lower courts, which is called the Rule of Four. And then they'll issue what are called a uh, writ of certiorari, uh, which is an order by a higher court directing the lower court to send up all of the legal documents uh, in any given case so that they can then review it. A case can reach the U.S. Supreme Court either through federal courts or state courts. In federal courts, a case will need to be heard in both trial, trial court and then a court of appeals prior to actually reaching the Supreme Court. Now, in state cases, a case will have to go through the state's entire court system prior to reaching the Supreme Court, although it does have to deal with federal power. If it's only state power, then it can't get there. Now, when the Supreme Court accepts a case, both parties will file what are called briefs, which are detailed legal arguments built largely on presentation of relevant facts and citation of previous case law that are then reviewed by the justices. Both parties will present oral arguments, which are, which are very short, usually less than 30 minutes, uh, arguments to the court. Finally, the justices meet privately, which is considered in conference, where they discuss, debate, and then make their final decision. Now, court decisions heard on appeal from a lower court, they, have, uh, they can be upheld, which means they agree with the previous court. They can be overruled, which means that they will uh, change the ruling, or they could be modified, which means they might just change a small part of the decision, but not necessarily the whole decision. A Supreme Court decision is officially announced in, in the majority opinion that announces the court's decision and sets out the reasoning on which it was based. This is going to be written by a justice in the majority and officially called the opinion of the court, but often additionally will include a dissenting opinion that discusses why not all justices agreed with the verdict. And this one's going to be written by a justice that is in the minority. Now, if you have a decision that's unanimous, meaning everyone agrees, then there will not actually be a dissenting opinion. Uh, but decisions will also have concurring opinions, which basically means other people will say, this is why I also agreed, though. As the Supreme Court has the final authority in many cases, majority opinions will serve as legal precedents. I note I did not say precedents, but precedents. These are examples to be followed in similar cases arising in lower courts. Now, the dissenting opinions, these provide arguments that may be used by future courts to overturn similar cases. So those are the two functions of the different types of opinions. 
All right, that concludes Supreme Court and the Federal Judiciary Section B lecture. Our prioritized standard, again, was Government Civics 22. And objectively, now you can examine the scope of the judicial power in the, in the national government.